is that they wanted to do with their lives, and they told you, I want to make an impact. I want to make a difference. I want to change the world. Have you? Any of you? Yes. I've heard them too. In fact, I not only heard them, I actually said them many times. And I went further. I took that word, impact, and I decided that I was going to make a business out of it. And that's why in 2014, uh, along with my two co-founders, we brought Impact Hub to the Philippines. And, you know, this whole entire time that we were doing this, it was always about what are we going to try to create? What are we going to try to change? Impact Hub, uh, as a network, as discussed earlier, we're part of the largest network in the world. And uh, we have over 15,000 hubbers globally. Why am I saying that? Because of those 15,000 hubbers, they are the people who want to make an impact. They're the people who are trying to create solutions to change the world. So I hear this question and I hear this phrase thrown out to my face almost every day. Says yes, I want to make an impact. I want to be the next Facebook, Elon Musk. I hear that every single day. It's still part of my narrative. It's part of my dialogue. And so maybe this whole frequency of hearing this thing over and over again, that I want to change the world, I want to make a difference, I started to challenge it. I mean, what does that even mean? What does it mean to change the world? What does it mean to make an impact? What is an impact? More importantly, how do we make it happen? Right? And if you ask me, there are probably a handful of inventions and you know, current events, personalities that have shaped this world. You know, there's the invention of the wheel, right? Penicillin, airplane, I love to travel, that will always be important to me. And of course, the white world wide web, right? And then you have the world wars, you have the 9-11 attacks, and you have the President Barack Obama being the first black American, black president, right? Big impact, crazy. Cool, yay. <laughs> and then I, I realized, what tapos? What happens then? And let me ask you, let's be honest here. Seeing all of that, that those things, and compared to that, do you think you're making an impact? Are you really making an impact? Right? And so I realized. Maybe these moments, you know, this big pressure of doing a big thing, don't you think maybe it's the very thing that's limiting us? And I don't know about you, but I don't ever think I'm going to be like Barack Obama or invent a miracle drug. Maybe our wonderful doctor earlier could, who knows, but I certainly don't, right? And could it be this big dream of doing something big is what's keeping us stable and you know stuck in the status quo. I remember a good friend of mine called me not too long ago and told me her daughter, my goddaughter, um, was going to run for class president. And so, like at any stage, Nina, godmother, I put out uh, you know I went to the election day and I brought a congratulatory banner. I bought balloons. Thank God for my balloons. She won. Um, <laughs> But that's not the story. That's not the full story. She won by default. Because the people who were running with her decided and realized that she was always the best. And so they just didn't want to run with her. So they quit. And you know, we still you know, did the whole, you're awesome, you're, you're special, go for it. But then it started making me think, right? What if this pressure and this goal to win and to do great and to be big, what if it's the very thing that's causing us to stop and to quit? And so maybe the narrative has to change, guys. Maybe, the, maybe we need to take this motherhood statement of making an impact, doing a big thing, break it down so that common folks like you and I, you know, the ones who trail behind a little bit, you know, behind Obama and Oprah and all those great people, so that we can start seeing the everyday things that we do and think of them as great. So whenever I'm asked, I ask, okay, so the question is, sure, 
are. Let's make, how do we make the things that we do every day to be great? How do we do that, Sess? And one of the stories that I've always loved sharing is the one of the Acres of Diamonds. Has anybody heard of it? No? It's, it was popularized by, it was a book actually in the late 20th century uh, by um, Russell Cromwell. And it's been told in over 6,000 times in speeches around the world. And the story is very simple. It's a story about a man named Al Hafed. And he was a wealthy man from South Central India. And um, he was contented with his life. You know, he had a big farm. He was living the life until he met a Buddhist priest. Now, this Buddhist priest told him about the existence of diamonds, how it was going to exponentiate what he had already. Right? And so, flustered and, you know, completely obsessed with this idea of having more, what did he do? He sold everything he had, and then he went off to search for this magical glistening rocks, right? He traveled far and wide, only to not know where to find it. He didn't know how to find it because, well, he just went, right? Um, after he lost everything that he had sold, of the money that he had, um, he ended up killing himself because he was just so desolate. And so he died. That was it for him. He was in search of something big. He was trying to get that thing. Meanwhile, back at the farm, um, the new owner uh, was going out in the back and his camel was drinking from a brook. And while his camel was drinking, he saw something that was glistening in the water. It was a funny colored stone. Not knowing what it was, he took it out, brought it home, didn't know what to do with it, so he put it in, the, in his fireplace mantle. Days later, the same Buddhist priest came back to the property, okay? And so he invited him in, the new owner invited the priest in, and when the, pre, the Buddhist priest saw the rock on the mantelpiece, guess what he said? That's a diamond in the rough. And that, my friends, is the origin of Golconda, Golconda, which is the most magnificent diamond mine in the world. Okay? It's said that the whole diamond was found there. Okay? So why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because I've, along the, my life, you know, I've, I've gone through this story more times than I would like to admit. Um, but I've extracted three things that I want to share with you which will go back to this whole idea of how do we take everyday things and try to make it them, try to see them as great. And we'll always start with your why. Alafed, who had already was wealthy, had money, he had a farm. Right? Imagine that, can you imagine that was his property? He sold that. That was his. And back in those days, you don't become, you don't get that property just because. This was back in the 16th century, okay? And so, he became obsessed with the idea of a greater wealth. Never mind if he was leaving his family. Never mind if he was forsaking everything that he built. He was going to get it, right? His desire of having more weighed up the gift that he'd already had. The quest for more. And like everything, the intention, the purpose, and our why is what really will dictate the impact of it in the end. Let's go back to one of my examples. Take the internet, for example, right? It's the best mention in my idea. Well, maybe the things that are holding this together will disagree with that, but I think the internet is great, right? But it's also been used for cyberbullying, for voyeurism, and recently, trolling, right? Right? In the same way, charismatic leaders, personalities, like Dr. Martin Luther King and Adolf Hitler had one thing in common. They commanded big audiences. They were able to inspire movements, right? The only difference is that one inspired an entire generation to rid so of social injustice, while the other one decided that he didn't approve of one race, and so they would leave them dead. Both gentlemen had everything going for them, but what separated them is the cause behind why they were doing what they were doing. So maybe, before we start journeying and looking for the diamonds that we want to find, maybe you start with that. Maybe you start with, what, what is your why? 
And so in preparation for this message, I researched more about the story that I've always loved, and I found out that I found the expanded version. And I, it was it described how the Buddhist priest talked to the uh, uh, Al Fed and gave him instructions. So when Al Fed said, "Okay, where do I find these you know glistening things?" he said, and I quote. Um, find a river that runs through white sands between high mountains. In those white sands, you will find a diamond. Let me repeat that. Find a river that runs through white sands between high mountains, and in the white sands, you will find a diamond. And he went. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty stupid to me. <laughs> Sorry. Right? Um, why would you do that? Why? It's one thing to, to believe and completely unsubstantiated information. It's another to sell everything you have, everything you've built, leaving everyone you know, based on that. And that's why my second point is, passion is not everything, guys. And if you knew me beyond the stage, you would think that that is the most unsaid thing you will ever hear from me because I miss passion. I choose it every day, maybe. You know, I, I've been told that I, I ramble too much when I want to say something, like much like now. Um, and, but I think I've seen too much. And I can honestly say that yes, it's, it's still a core essential to what, to what makes us do the great things that we do, but it's not everything. It cannot be everything. How many well-intentioned, passionate entrepreneurs have I met only to end up with a story much like Alifet's? Sad, but it's reality. I mean, with all his wealth, you would think that he could hire someone to help him on that journey, right? You would think that he could have stayed and probed and asked, where do you find the best way? You would think that, right? But unfortunately, he didn't. Why would you go on a quest without even a plan? God forbid a map. And unfortunately today, this kind of uninformed excitability is still relevant. It's still prevalent today. Everybody still goes out in search of something. Oh, I'm just going to do that and I'll figure it out. I'm a big believer in reckless abandon, but sometimes you kind of have to think, right? And so that's why along with purpose and passion, I believe one must practice. Not only because it takes years to build up a skill that you need to have to be great, but because, guys, you have to make everything in you work. It's not just, you know, it, everything has to function. You have to exercise your mind, your body, your soul. It cannot be all heart. You need heart, but it cannot be all that. Okay? I once read a story um, that a lot of people will always um, go back to the heart, the why, because it's what fuels you. And I believe that. But I think sometimes people mistake um, heart for just having something to say. And along with purpose and passion and practice, I think one should be patient. Um, did you know that very few, maybe 40% of child prodigies in the world end up successful? 40%. And these are the known people who can do anything, right? So if it was all about passion and skill, then why are these geniuses not world class? Why is Donald Trump there? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, guys, yeah, come on, right? Because, I re you know, and then you look further and you realize that it's because most people don't stay, don't stick to what they do long enough to see the fruits of it. They just quit. And it's not working by. And I once read that there was a man who was in love with soda. I was too, but um, So soda, he was in love with it. So he concocted a beverage and he tried to sell it. He called it One Up. Damn it. Nobody bought it. And he said, okay, let's do a Two Up. Still nothing. Beep. And then Three Up. He got all the way to Six Up. <laughs> Until he threw his hands and said, this is never going to work, I'm never going to finish, I'm never going to be rich, I'm never going to be whatever. So he said goodbye. After a few years, somebody picked up the idea, bought it from him, called it 7-Up, and we all know what happened next. 
And I mean, who knows, right? If Alpha Fed stayed on the course, right, and channeled that insatiable desire to find that diamond, those diamonds, he could have gone back home and he could have found them, right? And so that's my third point. Maybe if Alpha Fed, like you and I, he can have, he could have started looking within. I mean, coming to the end of this story, um, it was a bittersweet discovery of this mind, right? On one spectrum, yay, diamonds, hope, hope, you know, hope, hope, diamond. It was revelation, right? But we see two characters here in this narrative. On one hand, we are reminded of a man who didn't know that the very thing that he was looking for the world over was right beneath his feet. And then you have the other guy, the, you know, the, old, the new owner, who, who touched it, who had it, but didn't know what to do with it. And didn't even know the value of the thing until the Buddhist priest told him what it was. I mean, can you imagine if that Buddhist priest didn't come back and it just stayed there on the mantelpiece? Can you imagine the impact of what, that's been, what could that have been like for the world? And so, that's my question now. In the same way, could it be that we also have you know, set out this quest for the big, for the great, but then have we really forgotten to look within? All these things, I mean, by now I can give you a status of, it, it, there's about, um, the failure rate of entrepreneurship is maybe nine out of 10 fail, right? And in the quest of them wanting to do big and to be the next Elon Musk and to be the best whatever, I will always be an advocate for people who say they want to do things. They want to be great. But then I question them and I always ask, what do you have in your hands? What do you have today? And they say, no, 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 I still have to get funding. I still have to do this. I have to do that. No, no, but what do you have today? Don't talk, talk to me about what you want to get to because that's already what you will prepare for, but then what do you have today, right? And so maybe, maybe we need encounters with someone like that Buddhist priest to remind us that the journey that really truly holds the most wealth is the journey that we take to ourselves. And so maybe the question isn't how to make impact happen. Right? Maybe that's not the thing that needs to be asked today. Because I think we all have very relative um, understanding of what that means. And that's good, because each of us will try to explore that. Each one of us hopefully will try to practice what we have and channel that to the impact that we want to give to the world. But maybe the better question now is, what are you going to do today? We've had, by now, four speakers, apart from myself. Uh, including myself, and we've all talked about how we want to do things because it's what resonates with us. How does impact happen? Impact happens when you start with yourself, and then hopefully it grows and it multiplies. Thank you all for listening.